Hello everybody, I'm Bob Meisen. You can see me there, I think, somewhere. And um, I'm talking about the problem of light pollution. I'm talking about what it is, the various facets of light pollution, why it's not just an astronomer's problem, it's everybody's problem. And we'll talk a little bit about solutions and how we might be able to persuade Her Majesty's government that it really is a thing that uh, needs prioritizing. I'm a coordinator of the BAA Commission for Dark Skies, that's the British Astronomical Association's Commission for Dark Skies. For the last 30 years, we've been trying to persuade local and central governments and lighting professionals that uh, the problem of light pollution is growing and it really does need sorting out very soon. The photo is of Galloway Forest Park, one of our first dark sky protected areas in the UK now. We have um, a lot of dark sky reserves, parks, we have dark sky discovery sites, all sorts of places where the people involved try to keep the local lighting sensible, but of course uh, there's no protection in law for the night sky at all. The only part of our environment that has no protection is the night sky. We live in a galaxy. It's a big galaxy on the whole. It contains possibly 500,000 million stars. That's half a trillion stars. And as we look at it from a dark place, and there are some in the UK, we can see not only stars, we see a cloudy effect, millions of stars so densely packed that they appear as clouds, we see dark lanes running through the middle of the Milky Way. The dark lanes are, as it says in my caption, the ashes of dead stars, the ingredients for everything that exists. Your body is made of that dust. Everything you see around you, the walls, the ceiling, the furniture, everything is stardust. Some of you may remember that old 60s song, We Are Stardust, it's absolutely true. Someone else has said that we're actually a pile of nuclear waste from dead stars, but I, I prefer my stardust uh, definition, it sounds nicer. Many people think that the stars are far away, the fact that we can't see them doesn't really matter, they've got nothing to do with our lives. Well, they are in fact our chemical parents. We come from up there and our distant ancestors half a million years ago would look up and wonder all about it. And I think it's even more wonderful that nowadays we do know what those stars are, we know what that dust is, and we know our intimate relationship with them. It's a wonderful thing, the night sky. Here's a photo of Cranbourne Chase. I live in Wimborne in Dorset near the south coast, and not far from me, is a very large area of protected dark skies. It's Britain's latest international dark sky reserve. And here we are looking across a field of NHS poppies, would you believe? And in the background, the aurora, the northern lights, captured by Oliver Taylor. The northern lights from the south coast? Yeah, you can see the northern lights from anywhere in the UK, more so in Scotland sometimes in the south of England. But of course, this is just one of the sites that light pollution has stolen away from us. What is light pollution? Some people think it's light going upwards. Well, if you think about it, it's actually light coming downwards, isn't it? The light from badly aimed lights, the kind of things you see stuck on people's walls nowadays that shine upwards, uh, lots of sports lights that shine upwards and outwards instead of down onto the playing area. That light goes upwards and it hits molecules, it hits dust particles, it hits pollen grains, it hits all the little impurities in the atmosphere and it scatters. It scatters around, it jumps about between these particles and some of it gets reflected downwards. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing light coming down from the impurities of the atmosphere. If the atmosphere were totally clear and pure, there wouldn't be any light pollution. Here's another beautiful sight that you might see sometimes. Uh, in the summer, June, July, August, you get these weird, rather ghostly, shining clouds in the sky. They're called noctilucent clouds. 
mesospheric clouds. They appear in the north, they're a polar phenomenon, they're very very high altitude clouds. Why are they shining? Because they're catching the sunlight. They're high enough above the planet to catch the sun even when it's below the horizon. And if you can see my cursor, there is a glowworm struggling vainly to match the brightness of the night sky here. Glowworms are on the decline in this country. Like most invertebrates, glowworms, they're sort of beetle uh, type creatures, as you probably know. Uh, they're on the decline, and a lot of the reason for biodiversity decline is simply that there's no night left in many parts of the UK. Even a long way from a town or a city, the sky is bright, light travels. And so these creatures who are used to living in the dark, they've evolved for millions of years with the day night cycle, they no longer have it and they suffer and they die. Snowdonia is another one of our national parks, which is a protected dark sky area. In fact, Wales has 18% of its land surface uh, under these protected dark sky areas. Remember, they're not protected by law, they're protected by the efforts of the hard working teams of people who manage the dark sky schemes. Another one of our recent dark sky areas is the dark sky park at Tomintool and Glenlivet in Scotland, Western Scotland, and plenty of aurorae there when the weather permits. So what is light pollution? Well, we've said that it's light traveling from badly aimed lights. Here are some of them. This is on my local hospital. Have a look at it. The light source is that little yellow rectangle in the middle. It's an LED light manufactured in the Far East and it comes over here in a container and it's put on somebody's wall, in this case by the Bournemouth Hospital Authority. Where does the light go? Well, as you can see from the way the light's angled, half of it, 50%, goes upwards. Why? Who needs that light? The people who need that light are the pedestrians walking down here on the walkway, the drivers who are driving along. On a rainy night, if that light sh shines into the driver's face, they might not possibly see somebody in dark clothing walking across the zebra crossing. It shines through windows. The last thing you want if you're in hospital is a bright light shining through your window all night. It can be tilted downwards, but nobody's thought about it. Here's a golf driving range. Just over there, a couple of kilometers away, is Stonehenge. Yes, this is on a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I've written to UNESCO about this, and they don't seem to think it's much of a problem. Certainly English Heritage, who manage Stonehenge, uh, certainly don't think it's a problem because they don't own the golf driving range, so they say it's nothing to do with them. And yet over the most astronomically significant monument in Western Europe, the stars have been lost. I don't think that's a good idea really. And there are ways to play golf without bright, shine, uh, bright floodlights shining into the sky. I think this one is a lorry park. Did you know that transport related premises, lorry parks, bus stations, railway stations, docks, there's no regulation at all on them about lighting. The Clean Neighbourhoods Act, which is about uh, light shining through people's windows, does not apply to these transport premises. Nobody can tell me why. I've asked DEFRA, they don't seem to know. So this place can light the night sky and the neighbours' windows at will and nobody can do anything about it. Here's light intrusion through a bedroom window in Kent. There's a car park causing this problem and even with the curtain shut the light gets in. So it's not just an astronomer's problem. Light intrusion into houses is everybody's problem and nocturnal biodiversity 
these creatures with their circadian rhythms, they are the opposite to us. Bats, owls, moths, glowworms, they do their stuff at night. And if they don't get a night, it's very bad for them. Oh, and it's very bad for us too, because as biodiversity collapses around the world, we are severely threatened. We need the night, we need the creatures of the night to do their stuff. They're pollinators, just as bees are in the daytime. They do very important work breaking down rotting material. Well, you probably know more than I do about these things. Here's Matt Chardlow. Matt Chardlow is uh, the head of Bug Life, the charity that does its best to follow the interests of invertebrates. The evidence that light pollution has profound and serious impacts on ecosystems is overwhelmingly strong. It's imperative that society now takes substantial steps to make the environment safer for insects. A national light reduction target enforceable in law would be the most appropriate next step. UK government light pollution guidance fails to take into account the biodiversity crisis. That word guidance is important. There have been guidelines about lighting from lighting professionals, from the government, from anyone connected with lighting, local councils. There have been guidelines for three or four decades. They haven't solved the problem of light pollution at all. We don't need guidance. It can be thrown in a bin. We need regulation. We need a proper law about lighting as has happened in other countries in the world. The most interesting thing that's happened in lighting over the last decade is the LED revolution. These light emitting diodes, you can see lots of little studs here, these are the LEDs, and you might think, well, that's a fairly good light. It shines vertically downwards. Look, there it is, shining vertically downwards. But if it's too bright for the job, if it's far too intense a light for just lighting this small suburban road, then a lot of the light will bounce off the pavement and the vegetation and they'll go upwards into the sky. Why are LEDs so bright? They don't need to be. You don't need what you might call a football floodlight on a little road on the edge of town. And also, 1000 Kelvin, the K denotes the colour temperature of the light, the kind of light that's coming out of it. 5000 K is very blue rich light, trying to mimic daylight. If we mimic daylight in the middle of the night, something's wrong. You don't need all that light. You don't need that intense blue to see where you're going. Here's Mark Major, one of the most respected lighting consultants in the UK. I've met him several times. He's very concerned about the misuse of LEDs. He's very concerned about the kind of things lighting does when simple solutions could solve those problems. The more light we bring into the world, says Matt, the, says Mark, sorry, the greater some of the challenges become. Research is beginning to rapidly prove that you can have too much of a good thing. We all know about light pollution. And it's not just human beings who would be affected. Many creatures are adapted to the night. By bringing along a lot of light, we can really impact on their feeding habits, their breeding patterns, all sorts of things. We have to be quite careful how we work with this. I imagine that Professor Stephen Lockley, Harvard Medical School, would agree with that. He's probably the world's premier authority on sleep disorders. For our A4 booklet, you can find this on our website, Commission for Dark Skies. You can order hard copies as well. Contact me via the website. There's a chapter on human health and lighting. Professor Lockley says, Continuous chronic circadian sleep and hormonal disruption may have longer term health risks. 
short and long-term measures to reduce light pollution are therefore likely to have a beneficial effect on human health in addition to reducing energy demands. While we have yet to understand fully the environmental and health impact of being exposed to light at night, the data to date suggest a detrimental effect of prolonged exposure to light at night. My parade of experts continues. This is Chris Itikovsky, UK Sleep Assessment and Advisory Service. By leaving lights on at night, parents believe they are comforting their children. In fact, exposure to constant artificial light may reduce levels of melatonin, which regulates the body's internal clock and the circadian cycle. We've all heard about young people, and older people too, staring at screens at one o'clock in the morning, addicted to phones, and the fact that they are letting all this light enter their eyes when they should be asleep is very likely to be a negative to have a neg negative effect on their health. Medscape, any experimental process which inhibits the synthesis and secretion of melatonin, the hormone that regulates your immune system among other things, induces a state of immunosuppression. Clement Tockener works in the Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Fisheries in Germany. He's quite concerned about wildlife and lighting. For eons, all life on Earth has been shaped by the constant cycle of day and night. But in many places, night has been lost. This loss entails a dramatic reduction in biodiversity. So I think I've shown that uh, light pollution is not just an astronomer's problem. It's just one of the many things that is destroying the natural environment. Just one of the many things that are killing off our invertebrate friends in very large numbers. You may have heard of the splat test. This was something that uh, I think it was the World Wildlife Organization. Years ago, they asked people to count the number of dead insects on their cars after nighttime journeys. And I can remember, I'm old enough to remember car journeys when I was a child, for example, and the windscreen being covered in dead insects. Now you might get one or two, and that is the splat test. It's an example of how the number of insects flying about at night is far, far fewer than it used to be. Verlin Klinkerberg wrote an article, I think it was 2009, he wrote an article in National Geographic, and I thought this was a very quotable line. We've lit up the night as if it were an unoccupied country and nothing could be further from the truth. The night is not ours to take away because it belongs to a lot of other organisms. Wildlife that's evolved for countless years with the circadian cycle and they can't suddenly switch off. We are hardwired to have a day and a night and to sleep during the night. We can't suddenly stop doing that. Half a million years has hardwired that into us. Light pollution contributes to the diversity, biodiversity crash. How do we stop this light pollution? Well, it really isn't rocket science. Many environmental problems have massively complex solutions. Not this one. I'm giving a good lighting award here, the Commission for Dark Skies Good Lighting Award to Zeta Lighting in Bista. And here are some lights they've designed. This panel catches solar radiation and charges up the light during the day. It also has a motion sensor. And these are used as pathway lights. So it doesn't use any mains electricity. It only comes on when you approach it and it shines downwards, not upwards. That's triply environmentally friendly. This is the Clifton Suspension Bridge, or well, part of it, in Bristol. You see the little LEDs here? Can you see that they're little cylindrical casings and they have a cap, a shield here, so that light can only go on that metal. It can't 
go anywhere else. It doesn't go into the sky. It doesn't shine into approaching drivers' eyes. It doesn't dazzle pedestrians. These little LEDs all over the bridge make it a very attractive thing at night, but it only lights the bridge. It's not rocket science, is it? Here's a tennis court in Dorset. These little shoebox shaped lights only illuminate the playing surface. If you stand here at night, you're in the dark. And so the wildlife can get on with its nocturnal activities and people can play tennis. To show that light travels, here's, for example, a scene in Norfolk. This is a distant scrapyard lit by LEDs. You can tell by the white glow. And here's a photo taken in Somerset. And you can see the lights from Bristol and the services on the M4, Swindon, Chippenham, Melksham down here in the photo. There's a tree and there's Comet Hale Bop, 1997. The brightest thing in the sky it was for several weeks. And this is the point. This photo is taken in open countryside. It's not taken anywhere near a large town. But you can see that a lot of the sky has been despoiled by sky glow, the worst aspect of light pollution. Why do dark skies matter then? For countless years, we've looked up in or on cloudless nights at the star-strewn heavens. What did our distant ancestors make of the ghostly river of light, which is the Milky Way, our own galaxy of half a trillion stars seen from within, arching across the sky? They drew the stars into the framework of their lives by creating constellations, fitting them to their beliefs and myths. The stars, the moving planets, ephemeral events such as aurorae, comets, meteors, all these have inspired religions. Poetry, music, scientific inquiry. The beginnings of science might well have been people staring up at the night sky. They couldn't touch it, they couldn't smell it. They could only see it, they couldn't get there. And so they started having theories about it. What is that up there? Is it fireflies? Well, probably not, they're not moving. Perhaps it's dead fire. No, 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 because they don't shine if they're dead. There's science, that's science, that is, that's theories. And so the scientist in us may well have come from thousands and thousands of years of wondering at things that you couldn't actually examine closely. The mysterious and unreachable vault of the heavens has been a primary stimulus to the human faculties of wonder and discovery. We all need the night. Nature needs the night. Millions of years of evolution based on a day-night cycle can't be reversed at a stroke. We need light at night too. So let's make it as bio-friendly as it can be. And at the same time, the best it can be to allow a view of the stars. They're our chemical parents. Every atom in our bodies was forged inside some long dead star, except for our hydrogen product of the Big Bang some 13 billion years ago. We're closer to the universe than we imagine. Let's make sure it can be seen and contemplated with the help of star quality lighting, not the over bright blue rich rubbish that's currently being put on the roads all over the world. Our night skies in both urban and rural areas and in dark sky preserves can be retained by regulation of lighting, not just guidelines, by environmentally conscious evolution in light sources and by the realization that light has its dark side. That's a tin mine in Cornwall, by the way, if you are wondering. Paul Bogard wrote a wonderful book, The End of Night. It's far more important to use light effectively rather than abundantly. What increasing numbers of studies, as well as our own eyes, tell us is that we are using far more light than we need and at tremendous cost. Natural Bridges National Monument in the USA 
talking a little about the International Dark Sky Association. The Dark Sky Places program, all these British dark sky preserves and parks belong to it, was started in 2001 to encourage localities around the world to preserve and protect dark skies, dark sites through responsible lighting policies and public education. One of the most interesting things that's happened over the last couple of years is that in France there's now a blanket lighting law uh, which covers public and private areas and as you can see from the slide upward light has been severely limited to less than one percent for public and private spaces uh, the color temperature is a fairly biodiversity friendly 3000 kelvin which is no blue rich light it doesn't mimic daylight the light flux uh, 35 lumens per square meter may not mean much to a lot of people but basically it's a reasonable amount of light on the surface to be lit this means that there won't be a lot of reflected light going back into the sky into people's windows etc Lighting of activity areas sports pitches etc has to be switched off by one hour after they finish the activity sky beams and lasers are banned lighting devices that can be adjusted to comply with this act will have to be adjusted before january the 1st 2020 so that should already have been done and shop lighting and commercial lighting has to be off after 11 pm we now have an all-party parliamentary group of mps and we are urging them to copy this pattern when the British government has some time, because it's pretty busy at the moment, as I know, <laughs> uh, when it has some time to enact new legislation. Thanks very much for listening to me. I'm Bob Meisen. You can see my email address there if you'd like to contact me and look at our website. Just search Commission for Dark Skies and you'll find a lot of information and material that may help you to support dark skies work. Thank you very much. Goodbye.